He was tall and thin, a man of few words. With his cowboy hat pulled down, shading his eyes, he could have been a gunslinger out of the Old West. There was an air of mystery about him. You wondered exactly who was Jim Hall. For a man whose successes thrust him into the spotlight, surprisingly little was known. He was an enigma, a moving target. First, he was the teenager rich enough to buy and race Ferraris and Maseratis as if they were toys. Then he was the Formula One driver, far from home, holding his own against the best in the world. Next, he was the reclusive innovator, the engineer building cars called Chaparral's in Midland, Texas, a place remote from the racing world, but totally self-sufficient, complete with its own track, Rattlesnake Raceway, and a secret pipeline running straight from Midland to GM's R&D Skunk Works. At the track, Hall was not one to pal around. In interviews, he made a point of saying as little as possible. Some thought he was shy, others that he was aloof. To me, he was a man with a lot on his mind, and he wasn't about to take the time to tell anyone what that was. It was very much in character that many of his designs focused on something invisible, air. Drawing on his experience building model airplanes, Jim understood air as a palpable substance, its movement over a car to be exploited in an endless variety of ways. His first cars, like the 1965 Sebring winner, were strikingly compact, designed to keep air from working against them, a theme he would return to with the extreme streamlining of the 2H. His 1966 2E was possibly the most exciting car ever built. It was equipped with rear-mounted radiators, a semi-automatic transmission, and a giant signature airfoil which converted air into downforce to improve its cornering. It was driven by Hall and America's world champion, Phil Hill. The 2E's refined successor, the 2F, was also driven by Hill, and together they won the World Manufacturers Championship race at Brands Hatch in 1967. But just as we began to think of Jim as a designer first and a driver second, a terrifying crash in Las Vegas very nearly killed him. He was burned and broke both legs. The loyalty inspired in his men showed when longtime members of his team, such as Franz Weiss and Troy Rogers, came to the hospital day after day, not because Jim was their boss, but because he was their friend. His most radical car was just two years down the road, the Chaparral 2J, also known as the box it came in, a chainsaw engine powered fans which sucked the air from under the car creating a zone of negative pressure which glued it to the track. The 2J brought to an end a decade of innovation that changed forever the way racing cars would be designed, and many thought it would be Jim's last hurrah. In fact, there was much more to come, a second decade at the forefront of American racing, this time as Jim Hall, car owner. In the mid-1970s, his team, with Brian Redmond driving, won three consecutive Formula 5000 championships with a chaparral-prepared Lola. Then, Jim went after the big one, the Indy 500, winning in 1978 with Al Unser Sr. and two years later with Johnny Rutherford, who drove the bright yellow Pennzoil chaparral, a ground-effect car that was conceptually a direct descendant of the air-sucking 2J. Jim Hall is the most innovative designer in the history of American racing, and he was a top driver, a combination which puts him in a class by himself. But what has impressed me the most through the years has been his boundless curiosity, his quest to understand the fundamentals of how things really work. Along the way, the mysterious side of Jim Hall has begun to fade, the shadows to lift. Today, there's even a Chaparral Museum in Midland displaying the cars that are his legacy and whose secrets were there all along hiding in plain sight as car by car he taught us new ways to see we honor a very special person tonight or rather he honors us with his presence here mr jim hall some introduction eh? well Whoa. well deserved Whoa. well deserved now we're up here and I'm uh, I'm doing my best David Letterman uh, you know representation um, some people last year said you know you're as good as David but I don't think I'm getting paid anywhere near what David's getting paid so uh, so please uh, bear with me but Jim it's great to have you with us thank you Bob. and we're so thrilled 
And we have a, a couple of questions for you, and I know everybody is, uh -oh. uh, is uh, anxious. Uh, you know, the, the, the great thing is we're in front of, we're, we're preaching to the choir tonight. So, you know, from, I, I think you started racing around 1957 or 8. And, Actually, you know, started in '54, but oh, it was, I, I had a very limited career until 1957. <laughs> okay. like. But uh, from '60 60 through '63, through '63, you drove in 12 Grand Prix races. Uh, I mean, you've been doing other things. Obviously, you, you raced the 450s Maserati. Or, I mean, everything, everything from an Austin Healey. Your brother's Austin Healey, I believe, up to a 450s Maser to God knows everything. But in 60 to 63, you did some, you dabbled in Grand Prix racing. And um, in, in 63, you drove for BRP, which, I mean, I think it's arguably, they weren't one of the better teams. They were okay, but not one of the better teams. And yet, uh, you had a pretty good season. Uh, you finished fifth. I think your high point was fifth at the German Grand Prix. You finished actually fourth the year before in the Mexican Grand Prix. And given the competitiveness, um, why didn't you decide to, to give Formula One more of a shot in 64, 5, or whatever? I mean, it had been a pretty good, pretty good debut up to that point. Uh, that was a tough decision, really. I, I, uh, I wanted to go over and, and, well, you know, when I got asked to drive Formula One, I, I, I spent a lot of time making that decision, and I went, went talked to Sandy and my brother and, and, and Hap, and, and we all thought, well, here's an opportunity that you shouldn't pass up. So I, so I did it. And uh, it was, we, we had already started Chaparral 2. We started it in 1962, and we were pretty well along. And I was excited about it, and uh, I wanted to finish it. And uh, the team that I was driving for it, it really ran out of finance at the end of that year. We didn't actually go to the last race. So uh, nobody was beating on my door, uh, making offers. So I just felt like the thing for me to do was to, to come on back to States and, and finish Chaparral too and get ready for the, uh, for the fall races. Mm -hmm. did, you, did you enjoy racing over there? I mean, it had to have been a bit of a, again, getting back to the American racing against the Europeans, it had to have been a, you know, a, a thrill for you to a, a race against the Clarks, the Gurneys, the, you know the Graham Hills, what have you? Well, it was it, it was a it was a, a privilege to race uh, against those guys. Uh, uh, they, they, there were wonder, a lot of wonderful drivers and, and a lot of good guys. And I was a, a southwesterner. I I bet uh, I bet I hadn't run four races in the rain. And when I went to Europe that year, it rained <laughs> a lot. It, had, it happened to be a, a pretty wet year. And uh, I'd say uh, at at Every race weekend, it rained sometime. I mean, it might have raced during practice or before the, the qualifying session or sometime it, it would rain. And, uh, and, and some of the races were running in the rain. And I, I'd have to say that, that for me, at my experience level, that was tough. It, it really was tough. Uh, I, I lived in England for, for six months <laughs> then, and, and uh, people would ask me about it. And I'd say, well, you know, it rains some every day and most days all day. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so I, the, the Englishmen, if they if they don't race in the rain, they they don't race. Yeah. So it's uh, it, it's really a, they were they were actually much better than I was in the wet. I'll have to say that. Uh, I had I had a couple of good finishes. Uh, uh, the race I enjoyed the most uh, was uh, finally at the end of the season. The team was kind of running out of stuff and. And uh, my engine gave up real early in practice. And uh, so they just had one of Ennis's engines left. And I, I had carburetors on my car, and his had injection. So they, they finally put uh, one of the engines with injection in my car, and I got to go out and, 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 and practice qualify with it mm -hmm. and start the race. Anyway, I qualified on the front row. <laughs> and <laughs> and I, I couldn't believe the difference. <laughs> Yeah. You know, mine wouldn't come off the corner, but the one with injection, it would pull off the corner. The, it was a really a, 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 a eye opener, and it was a smaller race. It wasn't a championship race. Not everybody was there, but it turned out to be Jack, Jack on the pole, Brabham, and me in the mm -hmm. middle, and and uh, and uh, Ennis on the outside. So it was it was fun. As I said, Ennis couldn't uh, have been happy. And you know, about those that. kind of things you, you remember. Yeah. Uh, 
But I, I really did want to get back and, and finish finish the car, yeah. so that's what. Because there was a lot going on over here at the time. Yeah, that's yeah. right. We, yeah. we were really building some some good cars and having some good races in this country. Well, speaking of that, at the, at the time, if you look back, um, there was a guy that you became involved with. Uh, first, he was a, a fierce competitor of yours. Then he drove for you. Then he became a team manager for you. Uh, <laughs> then he became a competitor again. Uh, and his name was Roger Penske, and um, and of course you know this this mural behind me is a depiction of the the year of '65 winning the 12 Hours of Sebring, and Roger was the uh, team manager, I believe, of the effort at the time. And I just wonder, given the evolution of that relationship, going from a competitor to a driver to a team manager to a competitor, uh, in a friendly sort of way, was that a classic case of keep your friends close and your enemies closer? <laughs> <laughs> You know, you were both sponsored by Chevrolet, you know, so how was that? Uh, well, I tell you, Roger and I have been, been friends a long, long time, and, and we raced against each other in, in a way that uh, made us understand something about each other, and I think we have a mutual respect that uh, uh, certainly I have it, and I think he does. Uh, he's, a, he's a wonderful competitor, and he's, uh, he's, a, he's a great racing man. He's done an awful lot. And I can always say, you know, I taught him everything he knows. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, did he, he did he take direction well when he was a driver? Did he, you know, did he, it, you know, well, I mean, was he, uh, was, you know, was he telling you or were you telling him? Well, we were in a position where I was telling him. Yeah. So it was. It was <laughs> Uh, Roger actually filled in for me the end of the 64 season. We had a really good car. Uh, we, were, uh, we were running uh, quicker than most everybody in the USRC. And, and I, uh, I got off the road and into a ditch in uh, uh, Mossport and broke my arm. And I couldn't compete for, for a couple of months for sure. And so mm -hmm. Roger came in and, and filled in the end of the season for us, did a great job for us. And, and I think he enjoyed it. He, he, uh, he, he won some races uh, in the car, and I, 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 really, I really enjoyed working with him. It was not a difficult task at all. It was, uh, it was easy, and, uh, and Roger, thank you. It was, uh, we, you finished the season really neat for us. Yeah. Your relationship with uh, Chevy, speaking of Chevrolet, was, uh, is legendary. And, uh, like all relationships, each party has to kind of contribute something that the other can't. And describe for us the nature of the relationship that you would with Chevy. Was it a case of you guys at Chaparral creating and pursuing concepts and Chevy or GM, Chevy helping you to refine those? Or how did the, what was the give and take there? Well, it was a, it was a pretty long relationship and, it, and it, it, it morphed, you know. It was not the same all the time. Uh, uh, I got to know Chevy up at uh, at Elkhart Lake, where Bill Mitchell used to bring all his special cars and show them off up there. And, and uh, one time I saw him at uh, dinner at uh, Siebkin's, and he said, "You want to drive the Stingray?" And of course we'd never even seen it, so I said, "Sure." And he said, "Well, meet me at six o'clock out there at this track, and we'll we'll drive it." So out we went. Six o'clock in the morning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we went out there, and I I drove the Stingray, and and actually he drove it for a little bit, and it scared me to death. And I finally said, was it okay if I drive? You know, so, so. You mean you rode with him? Yeah, I rode oh, with him. Oh, boy. And, uh, and he wanted to, me to come down to Detroit and see his, uh, his uh, skunk works. So, you know, he had a lot of projects going on. So I did that, and, and, uh, and he introduced me to a fellow that ran a small uh, division at General Motors uh, called Chevy R&D. And his name was Frank Winchell. And, and they were building... Uh, they were building a little monocoque uh, chassis out of steel for a Corvair project, mm -hmm. and he wanted to show me that. Well, I, I had already started our car, which was a, a fiberglass reinforced uh, monocoque for the, for the uh, sports racer. And so I was interested to see what that was, and, and that's how I got to know those people. When I had was, went to Europe in 63, uh, Hap, who had gone with me, uh, uh, got 
did something with Frank, and Frank said, you know, we got some weather problems up here, and, and you got a test track, and we weren't, we're working on this Corvair uh, lawsuit thing that they had going in 1963, and they wanted to do some test work in the winter, and it, that, where it wasn't just completely in the open. So mm -hmm. they started using our track, and I didn't actually create that, Hap did. So we had a customer who was coming down and renting the racetrack and using it in some shop space to do some test work down there. We had a skid pad, and, and that's the way we actually started in, in a relationship with Chevrolet. Uh, I drove quite a bit of those. Uh, when I got back, I did quite a bit of test driving in the, in the Corvair Forum, and uh, you know I got to know a lot of people. There was uh, a lot of things that happened. Right. So... In the meantime, we're building this uh, car, and we're, we had mocked up a Corvair transaxle upside down and backwards with a, with a converter in it. And I, I always give Hap the credit for that, because the first time we put the car together, we had a, a Chevy V8 and a manual transmission, and I'd been testing it without any body work, and I was out running around, and he said, well, i, I got to try it. And I, okay. He went out, and he came back in, and he, he said, well, what's the transmission for? And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, it'll spin the wheels in any gear you put it in. And I said, well, yeah. And so I thought about that a little bit, you know, and, and, and so I always credit Hap with the idea because that's what we decided to do. We thought, well, you know, single speed, uh, torque converter to get it off the line, and uh, we'll go with it. So we were doing that when Frank Winchell showed up one day. Mm -hmm. And he looked at that, and he said, did you guys know I was a transmission engineer? And I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> Glad you are, though. Right? And he said, well, I was at Allison for 10 years before I got this job, and that's what I did. And he said, I'd like to take a look at that. I think that's a pretty good idea. So hmm. lo and behold, about six months later, they show up with a thing called GS2, which was a, a sequel to the Grand Sport, right. with this transmission in it. And, and I was still doing some test work. So I drove GS2 in and out and around and helped develop the suspension. And, and we ran that little transaxle. And uh, when it got into 1964, we'd run it enough that I had some pretty good confidence in it. And I thought it worked good. And I said, could I borrow one of those? <laughs> so I got one. And we ran it the first time at, I think, Laguna Seca in 1964. And uh, it was a single speed. Uh, somebody said, what is it? And I said, it's automatic transmission. Well, it was. You put it in gear, and, and you went. <laughs> and uh, we, uh, Firestone. Yeah. We got involved with Firestone <laughs> about that time. And, and they, they were actually, we'd been involved in it. We were doing a lot of test work. And, and they started supplying tires for us to go racing. And it was a great deal. We needed, we needed it in our budget. So... I did quite a bit of Firestone testing, and, and uh, they would send the tires, and we decided we didn't really know how big the wheels ought to be, so we started making these wheels that you could put a spacer in. And so you could start with one that was, you know, the reason he could spin the, spin the wheels was that the wheels were about five inches or six inches wide, and the rubber was about that wide, you know, and you could just, and so we started going out with the rubber. And every time Firestone would build one, and they'd bring it down and say, well, run this on a 6. Okay. Well, we'd run it on a 6 and a 7 and an 8. And, and, <laughs> and, and you know, we'd, first thing we'd do is take it to skid pad and run it out, run, run around the skid pad, and we get a feel for it. And then we'd go out on the track and run it. And so the next race we'd show up with, I'd show up with this thing on 7-inch on rims. And the Firestone engineers would come by, and they'd say, how wide are those rims? And I'd say, well, 7 and they said, well, that's the wrong tire for that. So they'd come back in another month with a tire that was this wide. So we'd run in on a 7 and an 8 and a 9. And, and uh, anyway, by the end of that year, we'd gone from rubber that was this wide to, to running 12-inch uh, on the rear and 10-inch uh, you know, on the front. And... You know, we, keep, we kept having to change everything. Well, you couldn't spin the wheels all the time anymore, for one thing. So, uh, so we put another speed in this gearbox. And, uh, and what are you going to say? The guy says, you got this automatic gearbox? I said, yeah. And, uh, of course, we were actually shifting it. Uh, it was just a dog clutch gearbox and, uh, with a torque converter in front of it. So, you know, you just backed off the throttle and shifted. And uh, 
So you got the story about quite a bit of the relationship right there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, they, uh, we, we did a lot of test work for them, and, and they paid us for doing that, and it was a great thing to, for us to have. It was a business relationship, didn't have much to do with racing. We got to know a lot of people that were shakers and doers up there, and they, uh, they liked us, we liked them, we worked hard for them, and, and I think we showed them some things. I, I did enough work on, I actually, I did a lot of test work on Serve too. They brought it down, mm -hmm. and I Zora remember. brought it down, yep. and, and, we, and that, that car actually had that transmission in it, by the way, mm. and, uh, and I drove it. Uh, so uh, Frank was smart enough that he didn't want to put his young engineers in the car and, and get one of them hurt, so he just <laughs> decided the thing to do was to, to hire somebody that was a professional and have them do the work, and I got to do it, and I probably put in more miles over the you know, the years 64, 65 uh, on a test track and on our track that uh, I think that's what really made me a, a pretty good development driver yeah, and, and helped my racing because you, you just put in the miles sure. and, and it really makes a difference. Uh, that's kind of the story. And you mentioned Hap Sharp. Would it be fair to say that he's maybe an unsung hero oh, of Chaparral? Hap, Hap was a wonderful partner. Hap, Hap and I were equal partners in, uh, in Chaparral and, and he was running his... Uh, drilling company and he'd come out after lunch sometime usually and and we'd go over what we were doing and and Hap would he had a lot of ideas smart guy uh, talented driver uh, we talk cars all the time you know if you can bounce something off somebody and they got a like uh, they got a kind of interest like you do you there's a lot of BS that goes on but you a lot of times you come up with something and and they'll critique each other and so it, it really worked good for us, and when it really came down to it, if I said we're going to do it this way, that's the way we did it. So yeah, uh, it was a fabulous partnership. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and he won, he won races, too. Oh, he, oh no, he was he good. He was a good driver. He was yeah. good. He, he won he, races. Uh, the, uh, his pinnacle was, it was we went to Riverside in, in 1965. I had the new car. It was quicker. And, and I, I was out there putting it on the pole or whatever I was doing, and the rear suspension broke. And so, you know, I was lucky not to hit anything, and, and we f did what we thought we ought to do to, to make it where it would work. And, and I'll be darned if it didn't do it again in, in Sunday warm-up. And so I parked it. Mm -hmm. I just wasn't going to take a chance on it. And, and Hap went out there in the older car, and uh, I'll be damned if he didn't beat Jimmy Clark mm -hmm. at Riverside. So that's a pretty, pretty good. good job. Pretty good job. Yeah, pretty good job. You know, uh, growing up in the in the '60s, when you had the Fords going over to Europe to take on Ferrari, then you went over with the 2D and then the 2F. Uh, you had to have been more than a little proud when you guys went over there, and given everything else that was going on over here in this country, you went over there and you beat the might of Ford, which probably had a lot better funding than you had, <laughs> and and Ferrari and Porsche. I mean, the, the sense of pride from those uh, victories had to have been, you know, pretty good, I would think. I, I'm really proud that we were able to pull off the win at the Nürburgring and at, and at Brands Hatch. I think uh, we had a lot, a lot to do to get it done. We, did, we raced over there the same. We, you know, we used to have uh, white Chevy pickup trucks and, and, and single open trailers. And, and we hauled out the cars all over the country and parked them at motels and, uh, and went to the races that way. And if, if we had spare parts, they were in the pickup uh, under a small uh, camper top. And, and we went to Europe the same way. We shipped those rigs over there, and that's mm -hmm. what we towed them around with. And, and, uh, went a pickup truck race. in Europe in the mid-60s yeah. must have been a sight. Yeah, right? it was. <laughs> with a Texas license plate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I was. Uh, it was interesting that Al would speak about the tires at, uh, at the Nurburgring Ring because we had a problem with the with the tires. They the the Firestone wet tires <laughs> were just didn't drain well enough, and the rubber compound wasn't good enough to to work that way. And and we one day decided we'd just see if we could fix it. So we just took a, a tire iron and and cut a rib out of them so that they had less less uh, area on the ground and they drain better. And uh, it was taking a chance because you know you're putting more energy into the rubber and, 
and uh, you could overheat it or, you know, it, it hadn't been fully tested. But we did run them some, so we knew what they did. And when I wanted to put them on uh, for the Nuremberg ring, I got a pretty good look at from Phil, but he finally, he finally said, yeah, okay, let's go. And by golly, that was the right thing to do because they worked. Yeah. And uh, it was, uh, so I, that, was, that was a really fun deal. And somebody, t I didn't have any idea, but somebody told me after that race, you know, that's the first American car to win a major European road race in 40 years. There you go. And I thought, wow, isn't yeah. that something? We were proud of it. So in the 60s, you know, uh, when sports car racing was Can-Am, USRC was really booming, uh, the greatest drivers in the world came to this country to race against you guys, the, the Americans. You know, you had Clark, uh, you know, Bruce McLaren, Graham Hill, John Surtees, Jackie Stewart, then you had Dan Gurney, Mark Donahue, of course, Roger uh, was with you, Phil Hill, Pernelli, I mean, it was a real who's who. Which drivers did you have a particular respect for? Both on oh, and off the track. Oh, I mean, that hey, might be a tough question. Maybe it's I mean, all of them. I mean, what would you say to a group like that? Yeah. I mean, uh, those guys are the best, and uh, I respect every one of them. Yeah. So there's really no way to answer that. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I worked, I was fortunate enough to have some really world-class drivers drive for us. And, and that, uh, you know, I, the one I remember specifically that uh, was so much fun was the Formula 5000 because it was kind of an easy car to maintain and I didn't have to raise the money. Uh, Carl <laughs> came in, Carl Haas came in and said, how about doing this? And I said, he, what he actually said was, let's go to Indy. And I said, oh, really? I said, yeah, that'd be fun. And he said, I'll raise the money and you run the team. And I said, okay, you got a deal. <laughs> so so we, uh, that was probably in 71 sometime. And he came back a little later and he said, I didn't, I didn't raise enough money. Let's run the four, four and 5,000. And I said, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and he told me. And, and so uh, I said, yeah, I, I'll do that. And, and it was really was. It takes the pressure off you from being out there trying to put the budget together and doing two jobs at the same time. And I got to do, run the race team. And uh, Brian Redmond drove for us. And he, he, he did the best job that I can imagine. I mean, Brian... <laughs> I got I got a lot of respect for Brian. He 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 can drive a car if it isn't right. He can do a good job with it. If it's right, he'll really do a job with it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, uh, I don't know. We 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 finished so many races and won so many races during those those three years that it's hard for me to imagine that we were able to do that. And uh, we had good reliability. He. he he, he took care of the equipment. He was quick enough to win. And, and uh, I mean, it, I guarantee you, the last 10 laps of the race, I wouldn't have traded anybody for him. Mm -hmm. I mean, he might, he might not put it on the pole, but he's, you know, he's thinking about that. It's not because he didn't want to. It's because he didn't have to. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I'll tell you, Brian, thank you. Yeah. I mean, speak, speaking of Indy, though, real quickly, did you ever have the inclination? I mean, was the offer ever there? To, I mean, you won races there later on as an owner, but during, you know, the 60s, did, did you ever have the inclination to go? Were you ever offered the chance to go drive there? Yeah, I was. I, I, I thought about it a good deal early on, uh, and uh, I went there several times. And back in the days when those guys, uh, I mean, boy, Talk about brave when they were when they were running those roadsters, uh, you know they were they were made out of chromoly tubing and 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 it was like a big spring and when they'd hit something it it absorbed the energy and then it'd spring back you know and the, the car would go up in the air and they'd flip over and the, into the fence and you'd you'd think my God how and, and they went fast enough that they had some accidents where they didn't have anything to do with it. You know, they, they're, they're driving along, everything's fine, something happens in front of them, wham, they're, they're, they're involved. And I thought, yeah, I'm not sure I want to do this. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, and I... <laughs> 
I did test there some, and we and we thought about building a car to go there early on, but the rules changed. Uh, it was we we were going to run a stock block, and the and a stock block rule changed right at the time when we were going to do it. So we 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 canceled that project. So there's there's another reason we didn't go, mm -hmm. and. Uh, and I was offered to ride in, in one of those wedge lotuses, but uh, because it kind of drove like an automatic transmission car, I guess, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I, I turned it down. Mm -hmm. uh, they, I, I believe I, I, I think I did it after it broke apart and went into the wall. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I just turned it down. So you won many races, um, but I understand there's one that um, you would you know, regard as particularly unusual, how you won it. Can you tell us about that? Mm -hmm. I, 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 th this is kind of fun, really. I, and I, and I, 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 any of you would have really enjoyed it. We, uh, we had a, a Brian Lister built some cars, and we, uh, Shelby and I, went over and looked at them. My brother was in business with Shelby, and I worked there. And so I worked for Carol Shelby for a while. And, <laughs> and, uh, and we went over and looked over the, some cars, and, and we decided to buy some Listers for Chevy. So he was using... Jaguar mm -hmm. and uh, Jaguar transmission and axle and so we sent him Chevy and Chevy transmission and and he he put together some cars and sent us kits for listers to put Chevys in and so it was a pretty reasonable price car and and so I that I was already into the hot rod and the race cars so mm -hmm. I decided oh yeah that's what I'll do I'll put a Chevy in one of these listers so I did and and uh, I got, did all the hot rod stuff, got the Edelbrock manifold and Iskandarian cam and <laughs> popped it up and ground out the heads and boy, I, had, I was really going to go and, and uh, we went over to, to a little race tra track over in Honda, Texas, uh, regional and I got it off the trailer and, uh, and warmed it up and got to going and it was pretty quick, you know, I was, get, I was getting around there as quick as anybody. And about the about the 10th lap, the engine just went, Pow! you know, and it was, just, boom, it was gone. So that was early in the day, and, and, and we, we loaded it on the trailer, and we were kind of sitting around thinking of what to do. Everybody was out, else was out there Saturday. Everybody else was waiting, you know, running. And, and I said, we're just about ready to leave. And I said, you know, guys, what would you think of this idea? So we went over, and we pulled the engine out of the pickup truck. <laughs> and, we, and we pulled the engine out of the lister, and we swapped the intake manifold, put everything back on it. <laughs> And we put the Chevy pickup truck engine in the, in the Lister. And, and I went out and won the feature. <laughs> and, 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 we, and, you know, it was early. We put it right back in the pickup truck and loaded it, it home. <laughs> Took it home. Those were the days, right? Yeah. <laughs> Can't do that now. <laughs> That's great. Well, before we go on, just I guess one final question. You know, everyone can look back. We all can look back and reflect, you know, what would we have done differently? You know, uh, no matter, regardless of the careers we've had, you say, oh, well, if I had the chance, I'd do this maybe a little bit differently this, the next time around. Is there anything, you know, I'm sure you've had time to reflect on I that. Have. What would you have done differently, do you think? Uh, if anything. If you're going to kick me off here, uh, I, I got to say <laughs> that that, uh, you know, we didn't talk about Johnny Rutherford, who did a great job for us at Indy. We didn't talk about uh, Jill DeFerrin, who, who's a, a wonderful guy and, and uh, did a great job for me and for Roger both. And, uh, and the guys I raced against, Dan, uh, I raced against Dan a long time, and boy, he's... Uh, He's a gentleman on the mm -hmm. racetrack and, and, and a hell of a race driver. Yes, and, and I got to say, Phil Hill uh, was, was a big uh, part of my racing life, really. The first race that I, major road race I ever went to was Pebble Beach at, in, uh, on the roads in 1955, I think. And uh, Phil won that race in a Ferrari Monza uh, in the rain. And it was the first time I ever saw a race like that. And so he was immediately a hero of mine. Sure. And my, sure. my older brother, who was in the deal with Carroll Shelby, ended up buying that car. And I'll be darned if they didn't take it back. I went with it, took it back to Pebble Beach in 1956, and Carroll won the same race in it. So that mm -hmm. car uh, was suited to that track, and, and, and they, they both won 
won the Pebble, last couple of Pebble Beach races on the road in that Monza. Mm. Uh, and I still happen to have it. Really? Yeah. Wow. Wow. Uh, the <laughs> People are already out there thinking, what'll he take for it? <laughs> well, and the other thing that happened is, 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 is I, I, I knew Phil a long time. And, and uh, when we decided to go endurance car racing, uh, Phil was, uh, was one of the first guys that we, we wanted to try to get to do it. Mm -hmm. And so we did that, and, and uh, Hap, at that, uh, after he won that Riverside race and, and raced at Nassau that year, Hap pretty well decided that he wasn't going to do it anymore. So I wanted to take two cars to the Can-Am races, and I asked Phil if he wanted to do that too. Mm -hmm. and, and I really had a good time racing with Phil Hill, I'll tell you. He was a wonderful man, a real talent. I think he had more ability than a, than a lot of people gave him credit for. He was, he was plenty quick. And he, and he knew just how to take care of the car. He was, he was another one. He, he knew about, he was a car guy. He knew yeah. what you needed to do. For instance, that transaxle, you, you just, all you, it didn't have a clutch. So, you know, you just matched the RPM with the engine and stuck it in gear. And uh, the guys always used to say, oh, well, you know, your transmission looks, you know, looks like it's not used. And everybody else's transmission comes in with chips out of the dogs and, mm -hmm. you know, all that kind of stuff. And then one day they walked in about halfway through the season, said, you know, Phil's transmission looks like yours. And I thought, well, you know, it's, it, it, I mean, the guy yeah. was really good and a, and a gentleman and a wonderful guy to be around. And, and I was, I'm proud to say that not only did I see Phil for my first race win, but he drove my car in the last competitive race that he drove and that brand set. So that's that was great. kind of fun. That's man a lot of it. That's great. You know, I got to say one thing. No, well, you you, please you gave me going. a hard time on these drivers. Uh, Al Unser <laughs> allowed us to go to the Indianapolis and, and win it the first time. I was able to put together a team that was capable of winning, and Parnelli actually helped because they'd been they'd been running uh, Cosworth engines. And I, I the, one of the reasons I didn't want to go is because I didn't know anything about an offie, and mm -hmm. I didn't run alcohol, and I knew it was a whole new experience. Well, Parnelli had been running. Office, I mean, been running Cosworths, and, and Cosworths decided they'd make a race engine for yeah, there. Yeah. So the year we decided to do it, I was able to hire Al Unser, mm -hmm. and, and, mm -hmm. uh, and we could go buy Cosworths engines, and, and I got uh, uh, Eric to build a car, and, mm -hmm. and uh, boy, I mean, it, I just all went together for me. And uh, so I'm lucky in a lot of ways in, in things that I did, and uh, you, you can't just think you did it all yourself. I mean, okay. God, the, the people that help you do things and, and the talent that you've managed to have working for you, that's what it's all about. And, uh, and I, I've, got a, I've got an awful strong feeling for the people in racing and, and, and the people that help make it work. Well, so. you know, in, in the audience tonight, those of you who worked for Jim, would you stand up over the years? There's a couple of your guys here. Hey, well, <laughs> Sonny, yeah. see Sonny there. Uh, hey. Just a just a couple of guys. Yeah, uh, a great a great period of time, and 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 we are going to have uh, Johnny and everybody come up. But I just want to I want to thank you, Jim. Uh, uh, you know, this uh, having you here with us tonight is just fantastic, and uh, we love the stories. And I, we could go all night, I'm sure.